I always feel like creating a show for a new market, it's like, you know, part market research, part anthropology, and part espionage. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to be back on the road, you know? Talk to me a little bit about Cote de Neige. Tell me a little bit about this neighborhood you're from and, and, and what you remember of it growing up. Well, picture it this way. It's kind of like, it's the most multicultural neighborhood in Quebec and everybody's trilingual. So it's kind of like Toronto minus the French. <laughs> so it's really, you know, it, it, it's amazing because I think a lot of my cultural education and the reason why I'm able to adapt to so many cultures is my upbringing, is the fact that I grew up in Cote de Neige. You know, is the fact that I grew up around so many cultures and nationalities and all of that was there during my developmental years. So it was easy to build bridges as I was traveling. So it was like you you were you, not just in, in shops that were around you, but people you were going to school with, there were people from all kinds of different different places. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different places. Uh, and, um, you know, it was it was fun to also know at a very young age why everybody had different customs and different ways of doing things, you know, and uh, and it wasn't foreign to me, and it wasn't like, well, why is that uh, acceptable? It's like, okay, I know that you know my Jewish friend can't uh, play hockey with us on Friday night because it's Shabbat, yeah. you know. So it's like very quickly uh, understood, you know. I knew what Ramadan was, I knew what Eid was, you know. Yeah. They knew what Diwali was, so it was one of those things where. We never uh, had to learn that as adults, and that's a great thing to do. It's it's almost as good as learning a language. Yeah, learning a custom, learning yeah. of people. Yeah. And what were you speaking at home? We we're speaking Hindi and Punjabi. Well, Punjabi mm -hmm. with the parents, and then Hindi because they'd throw us in front of Holly, uh, Bollywood movies all day, so we'd watch Bollywood a you lot. You would speak Punjabi with your family, but yeah. you would watch films in Hindi, so you would learn Hindi from the films. That's right. And in school, French. In school, French, yeah, we were forced to go to French school. So we did, uh, I did elementary and high school in French, and then CGEP and university in English. I was going to ask when you learned English. Yeah. Well, there's also Hollywood, right? So I used to watch, uh, you know, I grew up watching, like every other good kid in my of my generation, Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. <laughs> what better way to learn English mm. than to watch Two <laughs> Hillbillies? Yeah. In a deep Southern accent. Yeah. <laughs> These are not being chased by the sheriff and the deputy. Yeah. So it was. Uh, Sammy, Sammy's talking a lot like this when he's talking. You know, <laughs> that's right. That sort of so Dukes of Hazard, Knight Rider, you know, like watching all those shows, uh, Chips with my brother, you know, we'd watch all of that stuff. And that's how we, we, learned, uh, we learned English. Were you better than others at picking these languages up? Um, well, I was better at anybody who wasn't Hindi or Punjabi to pick up Hindi and Punjabi because I had it at home. But each one of my friends spoke uh, English, French, and another language. Yeah. So they all grew up trilingual. Yeah. Just like a lot of people in Toronto are bilingual. Like yeah. they'll speak whatever they speak with their parents and yeah. then speak another language. So you see a lot of that here. We were always trilingual. And we were able to, to because we learned it at home and we learned it in school, it was, it was very easy. And I think a lot of times also with my friends, we'd speak uh, French in school and then uh, after school we'd speak English to each other or during recess we'd speak English, yeah. I had a, um, a friend of mine in, who's from Montreal, born and raised in Montreal, but is um, Anglo, um, say something to me not that long ago that I haven't stopped thinking about. So we were somewhere and my French is okay, but it was whatever for whatever reason it wasn't good enough for what whatever we were doing. Right. And her French is of course perfect. You know, she grew up in Montreal. She went to French school. You know, all that stuff. And um, it made me think of you. She she said, you know, I you know I'm I'm thinking about moving. I'm thinking about going to Toronto for a while. And I said, oh yeah. I said, you know, I'm, you know. And she said, the thing about my French, like it's good, but I'm not funny in it. I'm funny in English. It's my first language. I can be funny in English. I can't seem to be funny in in French. Wow. Have that, you ever, yeah. can you relate to that? Do, 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 you, do you know what she meant? I mean, I think so, but I think it's, it's a very easy adaptation to make. I think she just has to just work it out linguistically a little bit. Because my adaptation isn't just uh, linguistic, it's cultural. Meaning when I do my French show in Quebec, it's completely different than my French show from France, or at least 75% different. You know, when I went to France, I actually lived there, you know, did a lot of research. I mean, I, I always feel like creating a show for a new market, it's like, you know, part market research, 
part anthropology and part espionage. <laughs> and you have to you have to really dig and be able to adapt. And I feel like that if I just transposed my Quebec show to France, it would never have worked. And a lot of people have tried that and it fails miserably, miserably. So I think there's an adaptation. And like the same thing when I'm doing my Canadian tour, it's completely different from a tour in England. And it'll be you know, it'll be slightly different from a tour in in, uh, in the U.S. Are, are you talking about the references that you'll make? Like, so in in Quebec, you'll reference the CAQ, or you know, in France, you might reference Macron. Mm -hmm. Or are you talking about like, I know this is sort of deep, but like, are you talking about like what is funny, like the things that are funny to a French French audience versus the things that are funny to a Quebec audience? Well, I think the references, but also the material. So it's not just taking a bit and then changing a reference because it still won't hit the target. I think you just have to create a new, a whole new perspective. So when I went to France, it was also coming in for the first time, taking whatever they saw as wallpaper and, you know, background stuff and writing a show about it from an outsider's point of view yeah. and to be able to identify that and to say, here's what, here's who I am. Hey, what's up? My name's Sugar Sammy. I'm from Canada. And here's what I think about you. Yeah. And then just go in, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of times they'd be like, oh, how does he know us so well? It's because I spent a year and a half there just living amongst the yeah. French and, you know, sort of taking notes. And but, but when you're in Quebec, you're, you're able to do it like, I'm home. I'm home. However, I think this is the interesting part is no matter where I go, and this is something I think I'm very attached to, I want to keep, I always have that outsider label, even at home. So when I'm touring Canada, it's like, oh, that guy from Quebec. When I'm touring... Quebec, it's like, oh, the Anglo, Montreal, or Canadian guy. When I tour France, obviously, I'm the Canadian guy coming in. And when I'm in the U.S., I'm, you know, the, the Canadian guy roasting the Americans. But I feel like that outsider's point of view has always served me well. And it's all, always a great way to, I think, audit a culture pretty honestly and then report back. Is it ever lonely? Is it ever lonely? I think where I do find home is always in Cote d'Inez. Yeah. circling back. So I always feel like that's the one place I don't feel like an outsider. I definitely feel like I'm, I'm, I'm home. And even though um, I tour the world, you know, I still live very close to the neighborhood and I make sure that I do everything in that neighborhood. So I do my grocery shopping there. I'll do my banking there. I just anchor myself there as much as possible to, you know, remind myself of home and then be able to go back in the world again. And it, it always, I think, gives me a, a good boost to come back. They must be proud of you there. I think they are, yeah. I mean, I feel it, you know? It feels like you're always treated like a family member, you know? And and it's funny, too. It's like uh, I'm, I sort of miss the uh, <laughs> the treatment. I was telling someone the other day, I was I was in, like, the east end of Montreal, and, and you know, I remember walking into the store, and someone working there was like, hey, so great to see you. We haven't seen you around in a while. It's so great and, like, super nice, you know? And I'm like, this is not Cote d'Inez. I miss... You know, I remember walking into a shop in Côte d'Inez and the lady hadn't seen me for a while. She's like, I thought you were in France. You got fat. And I was like, this is what I miss. It's like, you know, these people grounding me <laughs> and reminding me where I'm from. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. I love, I love, people are very nice up here. I love going back to Newfoundland. Doesn't it feel good? And just mocking me. Yeah. Relentlessly. Or, you know, or that kind of thing. Like, oh, or like I remember one time I accidentally, so in Newfoundland, instead of Loblaws, we have Dominion. Yeah. And I accidentally said, oh, yeah, I got that at Loblaws. <laughs> oh, listen to himself at Loblaws now. <laughs> oh, must be nice out there. Look at Johnny Loblaws, you know? Big, the big city boy. Uh, just <laughs> mocking me. And it, I love it. Yeah, of I course. Never... It grounds you. I think you need it, you know? The crowd work you do is incredible. Mm. You're great at it. Um, it's become a bit of your calling card. Right. Were you good at it right away? No. You know, it, it, it doesn't lie. I think those are years of experience. I mean, that's 27, seven years in the business, uh, performing, you know, th thousands of shows in different contexts forces you to have that muscle. Uh, and especially in places where if you're not alert, if you're not able to defend yourself with and be witty, they'll eat you up. I think that came from performing in England uh, 10 years ago. I think I really developed that, started developing that there. And then in France, of course. you know What, what happened in England? I mean, they're tough. They're a tough audience. France is the toughest I've seen, uh, you know, but England, uh, if, you know, they'll start heckling, in you, heckling you. And if you don't have clever comebacks ready, 
the crowd will slowly turn on you like a pack of wolves. <laughs> have you <laughs> and, been on stage and that's happened? Oh, that's I've seen it happen and I, it's almost happened and I had to get out of it. Yeah, so uh, it, it's good. It's like, it's, you know, the urgency of saving yourself, you know, because you literally die up there if you're not getting a laugh as a comic. I mean, a, a one minute silence is a very long minute as a stand up, you know, so uh, so you have to develop that muscle pretty quickly. But I think it also happened in Canada because in Canada we have this culture of really appreciating the MC that job in a comedy club, people know the hierarchy of it is the headliner, obviously, and then the MC is the second most important person on the show. Whereas in a lot of places in the world, it's kind of, you're very low down the totem, uh, totem pole, and that really helps you. So a lot of headliners on their uh, weeks off would MC, you know, at a lot of these comedy clubs because it's valued really well and it pays pretty well, mm -hmm. close to what the, the headliner was. So I grew up headlining and MCing a lot through mm -hmm. the business, and that really helped me developed the crowd work and then you know I just kept at it and it's something I really like too I love doing it just because it keeps me present and in the moment a lot of times performers and in every art form you've got your show ready whether you're hungover whether you're you know having a bad day the show is the same A to Z but you know there's nothing like having fun up there and you know as musicians they love jamming sometimes you know you'll go off script and you'll start jamming and that's what crowd works like is it keeps you present keeps you engaged keeps you like you know uh, keeps every show unique. And I think looking for that moment also makes me motivated to make sure that I'm, I'm prepared for the show and not just winging it, you know. I guess I'm hunting a bit for a story. Does it ever, does it ever still not go the way you want, crowd work wise? Um, no, I think I've gotten really good at knowing who the right customers are for that, you know? Like you'll throw out questions and you'll see by the way people answer. The people who don't want to be a part of it will shy away from it. Yeah. And the people who want to participate, you know, you can tell they're going to be great sports about it. And you can tell very quickly if they're not, you can move on, you know? So I have my tricks of getting out of it or going into material or moving on, you know? But you can walk out and look at an audience and kind of go like, oh, that person's going to be good. That person's oh. <laughs> going to be good. I mean, I don't think you can tell by faces, but you can okay. tell by the first couple of answers or who's, who's uh, who, you know, whoever wants to participate. Yeah, for sure. Why is France, you said France is the toughest audience. Why is France the toughest? They don't even come to watch anymore. They come to judge, like Paris especially. Paris is the toughest I've seen. And I tell them, like they know. They know what I feel. <laughs> it's a, I mean, I tell them that it's the toughest audience in the world. They they actually come to judge, you know, like they're, uh, uh, I tell them, I say, if, if I had to rank the toughest audiences in the world, it'd be Paris, number one, then ISIS, and then on, and then on, and then on. <laughs> but they, you, you, they're there to, they're, they're going to, they're there, they're not there to laugh. They, well, they're not there to laugh. That's what I say. Yeah, but, but they're but they're 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 gonna they're not gonna be generous to you necessarily. Well, they're not gonna give you free laughs. What right. I like about them is they're very demanding, and I think it made me a better writer to really write for them. I think when I left Canada to live in France and write a show for them, I think it became me a it it made me a better writer because I was able to write for an audience that was extremely demanding. Uh, also extremely masochistic in some ways because they really like it rough and they, they like being, you know, roasted by, by foreigners. I, I, I realize that and, you know, their own as well. Um, and I thought that was very, very interesting. And I think having acquired an appetite for that, I brought it back home. And I think this new show sort of reflects that as well, which is fun. You're roasting the audiences a little bit more in this show? Oh, yeah. This is a definitely a, a, a way... A way more, uh, I think, uh, it's 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 a way more cunning show. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it, it cuts hard, this one. Uh, Canadian audiences generally cool with that? They're cool. I think I had to adjust as well. Like, I think it was fun because it was, you know, writing with the appetite that I had uh, developed in France, but for a Canadian audience. So it's fun. It's fun to be able to, um, you know, audit your work from time to time. The pandemic, like, sort of gave me that, couple of years of like really looking at it and then saying, okay, I've got to also make sure that I keep changing my patterns so I don't become predictable yeah. to any audience, you know? And that's, I think a really good thing to do as an artist is be able to always restructure your patterns and, and make sure that they're always surprised, you know? I've seen you do jokes about the Quebecois to the Quebecois 
that I can't believe you get away with. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I, I, even just, I'm not even talking like really rough ones. You were asking somebody, maybe they were in France and they were from Quebec about going to McDonald's. All and right. Getting the, and I'm going to butcher this, but like you asked them about the Mac Poulet. Do you know what I'm talking about? Right. The Mac Poulet and the Mac Chicken. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She said, like, you said, like, what do you find weird about living in France? And she said something like, well, you know, when I go there, I ordered a Mac Poulet and they didn't know what I was talking about. Right. That was actually crowd work in France, actually. Yeah. But with a Quebecois person. Person. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And they said, um, they said, you know, I ordered a Mac Poulet. They didn't know what it was. And you said, well, what's on the sign? Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and they said, McChicken. Yeah. And they said, well, why the hell did you order Mac Poulet? But you're, that's a deeper burn. But when you read it, it's written Mac Chicken. And you said, no, no. I find that soft compared to a lot of stuff I'm doing now. So, so, I mean, to me, I always feel like that's the most interesting writing as a comic. I mean, to cross the line, you know, gratuitously is, is easy writing. To hold back and really water it down to stay in a real safe place is easy writing. But to really be on that line where you feel like there's going to be danger in the room and you don't know what's going to happen. And then to get out of it with a laugh, I find is the most complex and rewarding type of writing. And I really love that kind of stand up where, you know, you feel like this could really go wrong and then it never does. Can you remember a time that you were on stage, maybe in Quebec and you thought, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get out of here. I got to get this laugh going. Um, it's never happened at a real show. It's happened, I mean, it always happens at open mics, right? Because you're testing stuff. Yeah. So as comics, we always go into these open mics to test stuff. It's sort of like, you know, how musicians create in a studio, yeah. right? It's, yeah. a lab, it's a laboratory. Yeah. So that does happen everywhere, you know? It'll happen, it, it happened in France, it happened in Quebec, it happened in the US, it's happened in Canada, where you'll go up and you'll test a few things and some concepts and see how, you, how it works or not. And, there are times where it doesn't work for the first few dozen times. And then you sort of go home, you tweak, you write, you rewrite, and you figure out your way in, you know? So that's the challenge too, is I know this is a tough topic. I know this is a tough position to take. Now, how do I make it work, you know, for an audience? So it's, it's definitely a uh, very meticulous work, but in the end, when you get the payoff, which is the laugh, it's just the most amazing feeling. Are people always cool? Like, do you ever get people um, who might be a bit mad at you in the grocery store or... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You definitely get that. You definitely get that. I've definitely gotten that, you know. So uh, I figured out how to shop uh, at 24-hour grocery stores off times after midnight. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, I uh, you know, it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. And it happens here. It happens in France. It happens everywhere. And I think it's become a touchy thing. Stand-up has is, is become, has, as you've seen... Uh, at the Oscars, <laughs> yeah. has become uh, you know uh, somewhat of a dangerous job sometimes. Yeah. But I do think it's always been our job. It's always been our function as comics to address things uh, that are tough to address. And I think we've always been the first ones to um, unlock those issues. You know, to 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 unbottle all of that. And I think it's because you know we're not. Um, we're not by any way controlled by any committees or networks or, you know, regulatory agencies before we go, go up on stage and are able to say, hey, here, I'd like to talk about this right now. And here's my position on it. And I think for me as a writer, it's been interesting because I've been able to develop that a little bit more where I'm able to take a topic or take a, an issue, you know, see two sides of it and then also break down that issue and split it, you know? Like, for example, like, I'll, I'll talk about feminism, I'll talk about the pros, the cons, and then the divisions within feminism, like racism within feminism. And I'm able to do both sides of that as well. And so you really get to the bottom of an issue and you're able to take all sides and then someone's going to get mad because you've taken a side that they might not be, um, you know, they might not agree with, but you're giving a whole picture instead of just the picture that's going to be safe, you know? You, 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 and you're comfortable with that. You're comfortable with people might be pissed off at you. I th yeah, because I feel like what's the alternative, not doing the work I want to do, you yeah. know? So what would I rather do? Be happy and, you know, be fulfilled in terms of what I do as a, as a job or water it down and always wish that I'd 
done it properly, you know? And it's worked out. I mean, it's incredibly, I'm sure you, I mean, it's, it's even in the five or six years since I last saw you, like it, how big it's gotten for you. Yeah. I mean, look, I think it went at an outrageous speed. I think the fun part is I don't see it from the outside. So, you know, when you'll tell me about it, yeah. I'll believe it or someone else does. But, you know, I find, you know, I spend my time working and just loving what I do. And, you know, I spend my time writing and performing and, you know, taking care of the business side and all that stuff. So I never get to see that, thank God. And I'm only reminded of how well it's doing when people tell me, and I'm reminded of coming from Cote Neige when people like that lady at the store <laughs> tell me, and just like when you go back home to Newfoundland. And I find that's such a fun balance to have, you know? What was the ad I saw for your tour? Um, for those who, do you remember that one? Like for people who tell me to go back to my own country. Here I am. Here I am. <laughs> Can you tell me about that ad? Well, I've, you know, I do get a lot of that, you know, you know, because when you're, you're doing, you know, social political comedy, you're going to get people saying, well, who do you think you are? Go back to your country. And that's all fair when I'm in France or the U S but when I get here, when I, you know, I find that it's a, there's a different level because I just keep driving around in circles. I'm like, I don't know where to go. I was born here. You yeah. know? So especially in, in Montreal. So, uh, I thought that was a good way to address those haters. For those, yeah, for those who keep telling me to go back to my own country, here I am. Here I am. <laughs> it's really amazing to see what's what's, what's been happening. I mean, the, maybe the last question I have for you, or two more. Um, I think 2012, this, this show now is a sequel in some ways to the show you did in 2012. Mm -hmm. How are you different as a comedian since 2012? Oh, wow. I mean, as a comedian and as a person, I think I'm different. I mean, I think, um, you know, this show reflects my progression as a comic in terms of the form, but the content I think reflects my progression as a person. I mean, when I wrote that show, when I was doing that show, I was, you know, single guy in my, you know, early thirties, just getting out of living below the poverty line. And now like I'm a guy who's in, you know, in his mid forties, been in a relationship for nine years. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, more affluent mm -hmm. and, you know, has a career that that's, you know, where he's doing real, real well. And, mm -hmm. uh, and just showing that progression, showing how some things have remained the same, you know, like I still have to check in with my parents every day, no matter where I am in the world, I still have to FaceTime my mom and dad. And if I don't FaceTime them once a day, there's a missing persons report that's being filed <laughs> at your local police station <laughs> for some reason. So that's like, you know, some things don't change. And I think, uh, but I think you, you do see that reflected in also my interests as, uh, as a comic in terms of what I'm writing about. You know, I don't think I was this political or social in my 20s. You know, I, I'd write about, you know, everyday things. It was very observational, but I think the older I get, the more you get, you know, you become interested in the world that you live in and the world you're going to leave behind. I look forward to having you in another five or six years. Yeah. I'm hoping to have you in five or six weeks. Oh, great. Uh, congratulations on everything. Thanks so much. So great to see you.